Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Tuesday, May 17th. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and I'll be your host and moderate a question and answer session after our single formal presentation. Today's webinar is entitled, Understanding Hair to Alterations in Advanced Non-Squamous Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. This very important webinar is sponsored jointly by Daiichi Sanko and AstraZeneca. We want to acknowledge their sponsorship and thank them for their help in allowing us to bring you this very important program. Our speaker today, and I'll say more about him in due course, is a distinguished expert in this field, Dr. Fred Hirsch at the Tisch Cancer Institute in New York City and the Icon School of Medicine. As I said, I'll say more when I introduce him for his lecture. But first, I do want to present some housekeeping items that I think will enhance your enjoyment of today's webinar. We, re we often recommend that you refresh your browser, and that helps sync things up. And I want you to know as well, we have live help available all at all times today. On the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you can call tech support at 858-345-5916 and get help immediately. Also, we have live help if you put in a technical question in the Q&A box that you see there on the bottom left of your screen underneath the slide deck. Now, as you know, the question and answer box is primarily for your comments and questions for Dr. Hirsch in today's webinar, but you can also let us know if there's some technical problems with the website or the audio, and we'll address those and help you as best we can. In about a week, you should know that we'll post the full slides and audio of today's webinar at captodayonline.com. And I recommend that you have a chance to review, share it with colleagues, and enjoy it once again. You'll also, it's likely, see some follow-up email, not only from us, but from our sponsors, so I wanted to alert you to that. And finally, it's important that you know that CAP Today does not endorse any product or service that may be mentioned in today's webinar. And certainly any comments of mine are purely personal and obviously not to be taken as policy of the CAP Today or the College of American Pathologists. And now, as promised, I'll introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Fred Hirsch, is an MD and a PhD. He received both of those advanced degrees in his work in Copenhagen in Denmark. He's currently the Executive Director of the Center for Thoracic Oncology and Professor of Medicine and Pathology. He's the Joe Lowe and Lewis Price Professor of Medicine and the Associate Director of the Tisch Cancer Institute at Mount Sinai, all of which was within the Icon School of Medicine. And I can say that we could have no more distinguished and expert on non-small cell lung cancer than Dr. Hurst. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him to you. And so, Dr. Hurst, please go ahead and begin your lecture. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It is a great pleasure to uh, address for you today understanding of the HER2 alterations in advanced non squamous lung cancer. So here is the program uh, disclaimer. And uh, the aim of this presentation is to provide an overview of the epidemiology and prognosis of non-small cell lung cancer and review how biomarkers and personalized medicine have revolutionized the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. Understand why HER2 is an emerging biomarker I will outline testing methods for identifying HER2 alterations and best practices for reporting, and finally review practical considerations for non-small cell lung cancer when working within the multidisciplinary teams. First, epidemiology and prognosis of non-small cell lung cancer. 
as uh, probably everyone knows, lung cancer comprises different types, including non-small cell and small cell lung cancer. There are about 2.2 million new cases of lung cancer every year. In United States, annually 237,000 new cases every year. Of them, non-small cell lung cancer comprise around 85% uh, of the lung cancer population. That accounts for 1.9 million cases every year globally and around 200,000 in United States annually. In, uh, in uh, lung cancer, we are talking about squamous lung cancer, uh, which is about 22% of lung cancers, and non-squamous lung cancer. We will uh, focus mostly today uh, in non-squamous lung cancer field, and mainly there is adenocarcinomas and uh, another uh, subtype called large cell carcinoma. Lung cancer has unfortunately for decades had a stigma and also uh, had a very poor prognosis. However, though, I would like to see what we have seen over the last decade has been a tremendous progress. Uh, we are not finished yet by no means, but we have seen a progress in the five-year survival rate for non-small cell lung cancer. Five-year survival rate is probably what we will call the cure rate and it has gone from 17% to 25%. Of course, the prognosis is depending on stages. And we have uh, several stages of lung cancer. We have localized uh, disease, we have regional disease, and we have distant disease, or what we call advanced disease. And we can see the distribution in the middle uh, pie chart. The five-year survival rate, as I said, is depending on the stage of disease at time of diagnosis and ranging from a cure rate around 60% down to uh, five, six percent uh, for patients with advanced disease. The latter has, though, been approved uh, significantly, and the data for today is probably somewhat better than we see here. Biomarkers and personalized medicine have revolutionized the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. The treatment uh, modalities today for patients with advanced Non-small cell lung cancer include chemotherapy, targeted therapy directed at active driver mutations, and immunotherapy. The choice of treatment for advanced non-small cell lung cancer depends on histology or, and the presence or absence of actionable biomarkers. Targeted therapy is recommended for patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer and having an actionable genomic alteration, regardless of PDL status. However, for patients without an actionable genomic alteration, the choice of treatment may vary according to local guidelines and PDL1 expression level. The majority of uh, lung cancer, lung adenocarcinomas today are associated with gene genetic oncogenic alteration. There, the frequency of the uh, total amount of 
uh, actionable alterations may vary from study to study, but we see reports up to 69% of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer have a potential actionable molecular target. And what are the targets? We can see them to the right. We see EGFR sensitizing uh, mutations in the Western population from 15 to 20 percent. It is significantly higher in Asian populations. We see uh, KRAS mutations. Uh, G12C is now a targetable KRAS abnormality occurring in around 13 percent of adenocarcinomas. But we have uh, many of the targets, as we can see, with much smaller <coughs> frequency or prevalence. We can see HER2 a mutation, which is a subject for uh, the presentation today, occurs in around 2 to 2 to 5 percent of the patients. And it can occur in the exon 18 to 21 domain, as we uh, call them. Um, it can be in the tyrosine kinase domain, extracellular region, or transmembrane region. But I will come back to that. So to the right, you see the distribution of the more so-called rare, but they in my opinion, taking the amount of patients uh, with uh, lung adenocarcinomas annually diagnosed, these, each of them represent a substantial number of patients. We have been blessed in the lung cancer field with many new drugs and many significant um, benchmarks and FDA approvals over the last two decades. We can see here the most important thing, and uh, it continues, I will say, almost quarter by quarter, uh, we can see new drugs come to an approval consideration. We see in 2021 here, KRAS G12C inhibitors. KRAS was previously considered almost impossible to target. It is not a target, a target, a target able abnormality. And so is EGFR exome 20 insertions, which has also been uh, difficult to target before. No, there is certainly demonstrated very clearly an uh, outcome advantage in terms of overall survival uh, for patients who undergo molecular characterization with uh, associated targeted therapy. This is a kind of a real world uh, data study from, from Flat Iron Health, it includes 280 uh, oncology clinics in the United States, more than 17,000 patients with advanced non squamous lung cancer. And we can see here that it is a clear overall survival benefit for patients who undergo uh, molecular testing, as we call it, and molecular targeted therapies. The hazard ratio between uh, patients undergoing molecular characterization versus those not undergoing characterization is 0 0.54, significant reduction in mortality. It is important to get molecular data for patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, immunotherapy has uh, come into the uh, treatment scenario 
very quickly and very encouraging, but we know that immunotherapy does not work in patients with uh, driver mutations, particularly EGFR or ALK mutations. Uh, there has been uh, some uh, very uh, small studies looking uh, into um, immunotherapy in patients with uh, actionable driver in EGFR and ALK domain. Mostly it has been uh, retrospective analysis and was clearly shown that immunotherapy doesn't work in this targeted uh, abnormality populations. Uh, so uh, EGFR ALK has certainly uh, come up as important biomarker to determine before any decision uh, for therapy in first-line therapy in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. But other biomarkers uh, has also come into uh, the scenario which I will come back to. So uh, at the last uh, ASCO uh, meeting and um, uh, also published, it was, uh, in my opinion, some eye openers. We thought that most of the patients uh, had uh, undergone or are undergoing molecular testing these days. Uh, again, here we can see uh, the differences in median overall survival for patients with non squamous lung cancer based on real world data. And we can see here a clear difference between tested and not tested patients. Uh, even after adjusting of risk factors such as age, sex, stage, smoking history, and treatment history, there is a clear difference in overall survival. Here are uh, the real-world data uh, on how, what is the rate of molecular testing out in the communities. I personally believed that with the, whole, with the high education system we have these days, the percentage was higher. But as a matter of fact, we learned last year that only 60% of uh, patients had uh, uh, undergone molecular testing. Um, in this large uh, study from Flat Iron and U.S. Oncology, and 46% of patients received next-gen sequencing testing. Here we can see uh, the data. It was, for me personally, a shocking experience to learn that testing for five important important predictive biomarkers where we have approved drugs occurs only in less than 50% of patients with uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer. We can see the testing results and the timeline here. Uh, testing results was given back 10 to 15 days of the testing order, which I think is acceptable. I find the five-week timeline for starting initiating first-line therapy on five weeks, that is, in my opinion, too long. We are talking about patients with advanced lung cancer. This timeline needs to be reduced. NCCN is uh, the guidelines most of the um, clinics doctors are following, and uh, this is uh, the recommendation 
for molecular testing in patients with pulmonary adenocarcinoma. Uh, the, the NGS testing is recommended. We can see here that there are ALK, EGFR, ROS1, KRAS, BRAF, METREC, and TRAC. But there are emerging biomarkers which we need to take to pay attention to because they are promising, they're promising agents out there. They are approved for some diseases but not others. And uh, that is important to uh, pay attention to. And HER2 mutation actually is among the emerging uh, biomarkers. I will talk a little bit of liquid biopsy versus tissue biopsy later. So uh, let us deal with HER2 mutation among the emerging biomarkers. Alterations in HER2 can be a mutation, it can be amplification, and it can be overexpression of the HER2 protein. We know the latter one very well from the breast cancer community over many, many years, and, and the implication for therapy there. This implication has not been seen in lung cancer yet. But HER2 is an oncogenic driver, and we need to pay attention to it. What is the prevalence of HER2 mutation? HER2 mutation occurs in 2 to 4 percent of patients with advanced non small cell lung cancer. Amplification occurs somewhat higher depending on which methodology we are using. We use SHIFT for many, many years. Today, NGS is probably the most uh, relevant uh, methodology. And HER2 overexpression by IHC is also ranging very broadly, depending from study to study and antibody, antibody, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the prevalence of the three main abnormalities we are talking about when we are dealing with HER2. The HER2 family uh, is a part of the ERB family um, uh, pathway or network. We have uh, very familiar players here. We know EGFR is ERB1, HER2 is ERB2. We recognize HER3, HER3 uh, and HER4. What is probably important from a therapeutic point of view and uh, more and more to learn in the future is the heterodimerization of the receptors and HER2 is a preferred dimerization partner for other HER receptors. Here we can see the prevalence of HER2 uh, mutation in the different protein coding, coding regions and uh, specific variants. We can see that most of the mutations occurs in exon 20, but you can have those abnormalities also occurring in exon 19, exon 18, exon 19, and 21. So uh, you see the pie chart uh, to the left, but about 50% of them occurs in exon 20. Exon, uh, no, HER2 mutations are not frequently seen alongside other actionable mutations in non small cell lung cancer. As a matter of fact, in general, they are mutually exclusive of other driver mutations. However, they can co occur 
with several non-actionable mutations. And to be honest, we don't know exactly what the therapeutic implication of that is or the prognostic implication of that is uh, on this stage. This is undergoing uh, studies in related to clinical trials and translational research. As I mentioned for you, immunotherapy in HER2 or other oncogenic driver populations are mainly uh, derived the data are derived from retrospective studies and has not been uh, very encouraging. Here we can see real-world studies of immunotherapy with and without chemotherapy in patients with HER2 mutated non small cell lung cancer. And we can see clearly response rates are, uh, in my opinion, clearly uh, lower. I, I don't want to use significant because significant means statistical comparison and we have here data from different studies. But um, in non-oncogenic driver populations, we would expect 30-40% uh, response rates and here we see lower. We see also lower uh, progression-free survival and overall survival. So in, in conclusion, immunotherapy is not a good uh, choice in the future for oncogenic uh, driver population. And uh, I think it is fair to say that HER2 uh, is within uh, this group, but uh, still we don't have um, uh, first-line uh, studies clearly um, in that population. There are a lot of uh, studies underway uh, for HER2 mutation based on uh, different um, uh, agent um, applications. We know that antibody drug conjugates has come into the treatment scenario. Uh, very encouraging preliminary data has been uh, reported. Uh, we talk about immunotherapy combinations. We need to see what that means for HER2 mutated metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and also with small molecule inhibitors. Let me talk a little bit about HER2 testing methodologies and reporting practices. As I said, we are talking about mutation amplification over expression. Mutations are primarily uh, diagnosed uh, via uh, next-gen sequencing the clinical relevance is under investigation and uh, also for other uh, tumor types. While amplification today probably NGS is still the preferred methodology, but we are also using ISH and FISH technologies. The relevance in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer is under investigation. Uh, we have clear data in other solid tumors, which I would not come into during this presentation. And uh, finally, uh, the protein expression detected by IHC is also under uh, investigations in lung cancer. How do we bring HER2 mutation uh, into clinical practice? I think it is important to have in mind that uh, when we do, we recommend a broad molecular profiling and we in, uh, recommend that to include HER2 mutation because there is 
uh, many clinical trials out there today, and it is an emerging alteration. So uh, this can her to uh, mutation can be detected either based on tissue, which is still uh, for many the preferable source for NGS. It has high specificity, almost 100%, but it has also high sensitivity. What does that mean? That means that if it is negative, you can probably trust it is negative when NGS is based on tissue. The turnaround time is today acceptable. It goes from seven to 20 days. I would like to say, to say that seven to 14 days is preferable working days. Uh, the, there is, um, we can get many mutations when we do NGS uh, out of tissue and uh, rearrangements, and uh, we need to select benefits and limitations. Now, liquid biopsy is coming quicker and quicker into the diagnostic scenario. It has a high specificity, meaning if you are positive on liquid biopsy, you can trust it is positive and you can make a treatment decision based on it. However, what about if the liquid is negative? Well, the sensitivity is around 80% and um, in those cases, um, I would recommend the attempt to get uh, a tissue biopsy. Liquid biopsy, though, the technology is getting better and better, more and more sensitive, and uh, tissue biopsy has some advantages. Uh, in my opinion, uh, heterogeneity uh, of the biomarker expression we don't have a very good handle on it yet, but a liquid biopsy should take care of it uh, and uh, abrogating uh, heterogeneity of uh, tissue. Uh, so um, I'm a believer that we will see further uh, advantages and use of NGS based on liquid biopsy. Tissue sampling has been used for many, many years. As I said, blood uh, sample is so much, in my opinion, easier and less, uh, less um, side effects compared to tissue. So, uh, and the turnaround time is actually typically faster than tissue-based testing. So that is something which come very fast into clinical practice. Uh, NGS is the preferred methodology for mutation testing. Uh, we have many um, assays out there for uh, liquid uh, biopsy and for tissue biopsies. Uh, we have Foundation, we have Oncomine, we have Tempus, we have Gardens, and we can see here the sample requirements. I don't want to go into details, but we need to ensure there is, uh, when we deal with it in clinical practice, we need to be sure that we are in accordance with what, it, what is required with the respective assay uh, application and turnaround times as we talked about. Now, uh, the pathology report uh, in form of our clinical decisions. And uh, we, have, we are talking about four tiers uh, in terms of uh, uh, clinical validation and verification of the predictive value of the biomarker 
We are talking about tier one biomarkers. That is abnormalities with strong clinical uh, application and significance. We uh, talk about tier two, which is variance of potential clinical significance in this particular disease. And her two mutations are currently a tier two C biomarker in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. We are talking about disease-specific relevance here. And we can see what level C means. There are FDA-approved therapies for different tumor types or investigational therapies, but there are multi multiple small published studies with some consensus. We need more data. How to report HER2 mutation? It is important that it is reported in the uniform forms. It should be consistent nomenclature and it should include key information required to inform clinical uh, decisions. NGS reports should show her to mutation status alongside with actionable driver mutation. The report should be properly annotated in the electronic health record system. And if reports are from an external lab, we should know to highlight HER2 mutation in the list of other clinical relevant biomarkers for these patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Some practical considerations for non-small cell lung cancer when we work in the multidisciplinary teams. And multidisciplinary teams is strongly recommended uh, in academic centers as well in, as in community settings. We have in my institution a very well-functioning weekly multidisciplinary uh, tumor board where we have thoracic surgeons discussing, we have the pathologists, we have the radiologists, we have the nurses, we have radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and pulmonologists. And each specialty have to weigh in to the multidisciplinary care for patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer these days. It, is, uh, it seems complex, and it is more complex uh, than we were dealing with uh, 10, 20 years ago, but the complexity needs to be uh, in place in order to secure the most optimal treatment decision and management for uh, the patients with advanced lung cancer these days. And we need to discuss in the multi multidisciplinary team, how do we best make sample collections? How do we best do the initial diagnosis and staging? How do we do best the biomarker testing, which we have talked about, and reduce the time from a, a diagnostic procedure to receive, receiving the biomarker results? It is important because we, as again, we are talking about patients with advanced disease. This patient need to have as quickly as possible an answer and uh, knowledge about uh, the tumor status, the disease status, and the treatment decision. And as much we can reduce those processes as better, and that can only, in my opinion, only happen in a multidisciplinary infrastructure and approach. So I hope I have shed light on the 
uh, treatment paradigm today in advanced non-smoker lung cancer with a particular focus on uh, HER2 mutation, which is an emerging biomarker and an emerging therapeutic approach. So thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Hirsch, thank you so much for that magnificent lecture. I just want to remind the audience now, as we let you catch a breath, uh, that you can type any questions or comments into the Q&A box, and we'll deal with those. We'll stop at the top of the hour, so we have ample time for some discussion, and I see we have some questions coming in. One of the first things I wanted to ask you, Dr. Hirsch, uh, you emphasize that the immunotherapies are not terribly successful in these cases where we have an identified uh, driver mutation. Do you find, as a treating clinician, that there is a great deal of explanation and understanding that not only physicians but even patients need to have to understand this very important point? Thank you so much for this uh, question, uh, um, and um, the answer is, for me, clearly no. We have some data. The data are, as I said, mostly retrospective, uh, derived from larger studies uh, and very little prospective studies, but fundamentally, we are still in a very early phase of understanding the underlying biology between molecular targets, uh, target abnormalities, and um, the uh, association to the immune landscape. And there are currently many much research going on in the field. We don't know very well how EGFR or, or HER2 and other abnormalities, how do they influence and associate with the tumor microenvironment with important immunologic um, uh, biomarkers or landmarks. And we need to learn much more about it uh, in order to, in the future, design the most optimal therapy. Might be in the future that combination of certain immunotherapies with certain uh, targeted therapies might be an optimal treatment situation, but we are, in my opinion, lacking this knowledge on this stage. So the knowledge we Thank have you. is very empiric and very much based on, um, if I can say, very simple clinical data. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, there's some follow-up here that we have from uh, our participants, and let me uh, combine two questions into one. Uh, first, uh, it's identified that HER2 is the preferable receptor involved in dimerization and oncogenic activation. And if that's so, would pertuzumab perhaps be an effective drug in mutated HER2 uh, cancer in the non-small cell setting? And in small cell or non-small cell? Non-small cell. In non-small cell, yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are several drugs. Uh, trastuzumab has been tried uh, many years ago in HER2 overexpressed non small cell lung cancer without uh, success. Okay. Uh, uh, we thought at that time, and now we are talking 15, 20 years ago we thought that we had a story in lung cancer as we had in breast cancer with her two targeted drugs and monoclonal antibody therapy. That was not the case. 
Now, what has happened uh, more recently is um, advances in uh, drug development and uh, new drug concepts, uh, and that has certainly uh, changed my uh, our perspective and prospective of uh, targeting her to uh, in uh, lung cancer. And we are not anymore targeting the protein uh, alone. We are looking into uh, what does protein expression mean. We don't have definitive answer to that yet. But today we are um, talking about mutation and, and uh, amplification uh, particularly mutation, which we did not look at uh, 10, 15 years ago. So the diagnostic technology scenario and the therapeutic scenario has developed, been developed significantly uh, today. So situation today is very much different from it was 10, 15 years. 20 years ago. I'm, I'm personally very encouraged by uh, preliminary data uh, with her to targeted um, new drugs uh, targeting uh, the mutation, but we need still uh, more uh, data and we need more, uh, we need first line therapy studies. Thank you. And uh, we have a question now. Can NGS testing assess both HER2 mutation and amplification? And if so, is there any need to do FISH studies if you already are doing next-gen sequencing? So we are uh, doing next-gen next sequencing uh, practically only here, and uh, most of the academic centers are. We are trusting NGS. It can pick up both mutation and amplification. Um, I know there are still uh, communities with a lot of trust in fish, and uh, uh, some data shows some discrepancy in uh, prevalence. But um, in general, I will say that amplification can be picked up by NGS and, um, and be trustworthy. Thank you. I did want to ask you, uh, we had several questions. What happens when you see patients with more than one malignancy? Um, whether uh, it's synchronously or uh, above uh, in a metastatic setting. Is this frequent in your experience? Um, I will say that uh, um, multiple, multiple tumors detected in the lung is not infrequent. Okay. Um, I still have um, struggling with this. Uh, is it uh, is it the same tumor or is it a different tumor? Uh, we don't we we don't see we don't see fre uh, frequently a lung adenocarcinoma uh, and then an Non, non lung cancer together. That is, in my opinion, uh, relatively rare. But we see oh, in we see frequently, uh, and uh, frequently means might be ten percent uh, cases, uh, two or more nodules in uh, the lung. And those nodules can have different, diff from, uh, from time to time you can see different molecular profiles. Whether that represents two different uh, lung cancers 
does it differ uh, is it a result of tumor heterogeneity we don't have a very good handle on the biology behind multiple tumors very good thank you there's a, a quick question about the uh, NCCN recommendation of liquid biopsy being complementary with the uh, tissue studies. Is that a, a newer, more recent, updated recommendation? It is, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this concept have also been put to table uh, by the ISLC, the International Association for Study of Lung Cancer, they have come out with uh, some consen consensus uh, report uh, very recently. Um, it was at the latter end of last year, I think it was, uh, okay. in Jour Journal of Thoracic Oncology, and they have put also the same concept to the table that uh, there might be some advantages doing both tissue characterization and liquid characterization in parallel. And there are some cases which, where you have, uh, we talked about the false negative. Uh, it can occur occasionally also false positive. Um, in both assay uh, compartments. Uh, so um, there is some reasoning for doing it in, uh, in uh, parallel, but um, everything comes with a cost. And uh, I will say still in our institution, uh, tissue, assaying is still the preferable, particularly in the initial diagnosis, uh, but we do, uh, we are starting doing more and more liquid in parallel. The liquid biopsy have certainly advantages when we are talking monitoring the disease. It is easier, much easier to monitor the disease with liquid biopsy, of course, than compared to tissue biopsy. So um, a big advantage there. Uh, what is the clinical relevance of this uh, during therapy is still uh, to be clearly demonstrated in uh, clinical research. Uh, we and others are doing uh, clinical studies monitoring disease course and treatment course with liquid biopsy, but we need, uh, we need more data and complete the studies before we can say uh, for sure that this has advantages compared to imaging and uh, other modalities. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, we only have a couple minutes left, but I did want to return um, to the very interesting data that you presented and your reaction to that data that many patients are not really getting a proper um, testing of the relevant biomarkers in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, now, I think that the, the data that you show are compelling and saddening. It's also the, the, I think, a fairly widespread consensus that there's a disparity sometimes in the testing between great academic centers, such as the one where you're a professor, and some other community uh, uh, entities. Would you care to comment on, or talk about recommendations you would make to improve these biomarker testing rates? Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. Very important points. And uh, I, I agree with you. You used the word saddening. Uh, I was almost shocked to see those uh, data from uh, community practices in United States. Uh, I have spent uh, much of my professional uh, life uh, in 
oncology education and uh, implementation of uh, diagnostics and uh, new treatments. And uh, this was uh, saddening, as you said. We, uh, we need to uh, act on it, and we need to act on it very quickly. There is a clear need for education, particularly in community practices. That is very clear. I will say practically most of our patients today, if not all, should have molecular testing. Um, we know very well anecdotally uh, that uh, patients, even in a poor performance status, if the perform poor performance status is due to the malignancy and not comorbidity, if it is due to malignancy and the patient have a targetable abnormality, this patient's life perspective can change significantly if you give the patient the targeted therapy, and it can change very quickly. <clears throat> so, bottom line, education, education, education. That is the key word. We know real estate has location, location, location. Here we have education, education, education. I cannot repeat it enough. And we have, Thank you. we have responsibilities, academic uh, centers, academic organizations, and uh, industry. We have all the same responsibilities uh, towards those patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hurst. I think I'm going to leave you with the last word, and a very, very important word it is, and I couldn't agree more. And so with that, we'll begin to wrap up. Of course, I want to thank Dr. Fred Hirsch. He gave a magnificent lecture. You can see it online at CAP Today Online in about a week, and I'm sure you'll want to review it. It's also rich with references. I want to thank Daiichi Sanko and AstraZeneca for their sponsorship in bringing us this important webinar. And finally, I want to thank all of you for taking time out today to join us in this very important webinar. We're grateful for your attendance, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. So once again, our thanks to Dr. Hirsch, Dr. to Daiichi Sanko, to AstraZeneca, and to all of you. And with that, this is Bob McGonigal. I'll bring the webinar to a close. <laughs>